work at Arkansas Children's Hospital. I've been at Arkansas Children's Hospital since uh, 1991. Um, I started there as a student nurse in PICU. Um, and there's nothing more that I love than Arkansas Children's Hospital. I can actually say I go to work, <laughs> thank you, Bill. I go to work every day with not a complaint, without a hesitation, with a broke foot. And those are things that I think is important when you serve not just the healthcare community, but especially the African American and Hispanic community in this state. You have to be passionate about what you do, but you have to be committed to what you do. Um, I've done sickle cell for the past 15 years. I work with uh, Dr. Suzanne Sassente, uh as well as Dr. Shelley Crary, uh, Dr. David Beckton, Dr. Kimo Stein, um, and Dr. Robert Sailors and Dr. Ferrer. I think I got them all. I don't think I missed anybody. <laughs> and Dr. Mion. Oh, I forgot about him. <laughs> and we're still adding physicians to that. In uh, pediatric hematology, we have many challenges uh, that are before us, uh, especially in the care of sickle cell patients. Uh, the title of today's lecture is about the changing faces of sickle cell disease. As you know, most of you know I love to talk but I love to educate. So I'm not one for giving you out paper and putting things on a board, that's just not my style. I like for you to have a conversation with me because I feel that you learn better, but I also get an understanding of where my crowd is as well. Uh, all of you know that sickle cell disease is a red blood cell disorder. I hope everybody knew that. It is not cancer, it is not HIV, it is exactly what it is, a red blood cell disorder. Um, some people, when you hear on the news, when they interview someone with sickle cell disease, what is the most irritating question you hear? What is one of the questions that, first question they ask them? Anybody know? How did you catch it? <laughs> and that irritates me, because that tells me that the person interviewing them didn't do anything to educate themselves. So that, that just is one of my irritating points. But every interview you'll ever hear, they start off with that very question. How'd you catch it? How'd you get it? How, this is like, like you walked outside, caught a cold or something. And it's just one of those irritating factors. So that's why I believe education is very important. It is hereditary. As Representative Rainey has explained to you all, uh, both parents have to have sickle cell trait and or disease. The other distinguishing factor in the state of Arkansas is that we have many different types of sickle cell. When you hear the term sickle cell disease, it is an all-encompassing term for different sickle cell disorders, okay? The primary ones that we treat here in the state of Arkansas, with the most severe being hemoglobin SS. The next most severe is hemoglobin S beta zero thalassemia. The next most severe is hemoglobin SC. The least severe is sickle beta plus thalassemia. See, all that sounds foreign to you, right? Because you all don't realize that there are other red blood cell disorders that are in combination with sickle cell disease that can make the disease a different type of sickle cell, okay? In this state, we also have a huge Laotian uh, community. Uh, we have a huge Malaysian community. So they carry E-trait or E-disease. So then we have a population that's coming along with hemoglobin SE disease or hemoglobin SD disease, hemoglobin S constant spring, hemoglobin hope disease. These are hemoglobin SOA rab disease. These are terms that you all are not familiar with. There's a reason for that. And Representative Rainey hit on that. What's the changing face of sickle cell across the country, not just in Arkansas? What's the changing face? It's not just a black disease, number one. What's the second thing? They're adults. That's the changing face. If you all want to know what that means, the changing face has nothing to always do with uh, they move from one area of the country to the other. It has to do with the fact that they are adults. He asked a question, I wanted to answer it so bad, but I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna answer while you were talking. He said, why has there not been more of a push in sickle cell disease? Why has there not been more of an education and an outreach from the medical community? For one thing, the only thing they had to deal with was pediatrics. That's covered. That, it's a simple answer. That's covered. Pediatrics has been covered from 
inception. We've had midwives and caretakers and voodoo men and all kind of things, but they've always made sure people got to a certain age. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of people, that, that's culturally. That's across the world. A lot of people are under the impression that it's just the United States. In France, one of our biggest research components is in France. We have a huge sickle cell community in France. We have a huge sickle cell community in Great Britain. We have a huge sickle cell community in Greece. Didn't know that, did y'all? See, but you know. Uh, that's one of the faces that's changing. As people have immigrated, migrated, as people have changed communities, changed jobs, we've had influxes in different styles of education. We're crossing borders, not just state borders, but we're crossing continental borders. Sickle cell disease is not isolated because you are of dark skin and come from Africa. We all come from Africa. It used to be one continent, then it broke apart and did all those cool things that God likes to do, shift things around and make your life move. I like that too. <laughs> so ain't nothing ever to say. But uh, that's part of life. So that's where that changing face is. That changing face is because they're living. I don't like to hear when people say they're suffering with, because Representative Rainey gave an example. His son is living. Stop giving that community a suffering because they're living. We're all going to die. I hope everybody realizes that. But it's, uh, it, what counts is you're living. What did you, how did you live? Did you contribute anything? How did you live? Did you contribute to your family? How did you live? Did, were you an inspiration to somebody or did you just drag everybody down? How did you live? That's important to me when I hear people talk about sickle cell patients and suffering, because they're not suffering. I have so many going to college now that, and having babies and getting jobs. As a matter of fact, one of my patients got a job. Where did she get it at? At um, oh, Hollister. Hollister. She's so proud of herself. She got a job. She's 17 and cute. <laughs> and she got a job. <laughs> She's living. I don't ever want any of my patients to ever look at their lives and think of themselves as suffering. I want them to see themselves as living. We all have handicaps, we all have burdens to carry. And God did not give us these burdens for us to just lay down and lay under them. He says, pick them up. And that's what we're supposed to do. Uplift them, help them carry those burdens. Help them to see that, oh, I, you have that burden, I got one too. So that's my speech on burdens, by the way. Uh, <laughs> And that is one of the things that understanding the differences of the different sickle cell disorders, that's why that's also the changing face. Because we have so much immigration and migration, that is the one reason why we are seeing different types of sickle cell in communities that did not see it before. Uh, what do you think Northwest Arkansas is battling? That very same thing. That Hispanic population up there has sickle cell. And they have no idea. And that's a very private thing in the Hispanic culture. And culturally, we're having difficulty dealing with that. So that's something that we also have to battle. So it's just not the African-American community. I want you all to understand it's a broader picture than that. It's a much broader picture than just the little state. And it's a much broader picture than just saying just the sickle cell community, because they're a huge community that stretches across the world. The other thing is, is understanding how we approach sickle cell disease. Um, as he said, newborn screening was the way we, is the way that we discover uh, that your child has sickle cell disease. The newborn screening, and those people over there, hey y'all, that's my newborn screening group. So they are responsible for notifying people across the state, parents across the state, of that their child has a sickle cell disease. We test every baby, irregardless of race, color, or creed, does not matter. We inform those parents, we inform the pediatricians. Where we're lacking in the state in the changing face of sickle cell is our approach to sickle cell with primary care. That first barrier that we have is uh, with primary care physicians, helping them understand that when the letter comes to your office, your nurse should be doing all she can to reach that family. That doesn't happen in every community. I hope you all realize that. We have some great pediatric doctors out there as soon as they see that newborn screening come across, which is usually at uh, 10 to 14 days of life, they're on the phone with the family. But we have other physicians out there in the state, they do not do the same. And that's the sad part. 
is that we have the ability to involve them in education experience and they choose not to participate for whatever reasons. There are several reasons and you can think in your head, if you're from Northeast Arkansas, what's your motivation? If you're from Northwest Arkansas, what's your motivation? There's no money there. They don't see them as an important population because of their skin color or because of their race. They're just the workers. We can replace a worker. You all have to understand it's not always about not wanting to treat the disease. It's about the economics of it. It's about the understanding of how important that population is, how important your child is to you. And we don't push that enough in healthcare, how important each one that's seeking healthcare, how important that individual is. That's somebody's child. That's somebody's future. And we in healthcare have gotten to the point that they have become a disease. They're not a disease, they're a person. That person with hypertension. They're not their hypertension, that's just part of who they are. They're not their diabetes, that's just who they are. They're not cystic fibrosis, that's just part of who they are. We have to start that with sickle cell disease. Those are diseases that have gotten a lot of attention, whereas sickle cell has not. Because we as a healthcare community have not raised our voices to it. We have not bothered to speak up for that patient population. We have not said the changing face means that we have to change our voice. We have to change our push. We can't let them die because then everybody said, well, we don't want their dying to be in vain. At the course and pace we're going, it will be. If we don't learn how to talk, if we as a community, not just healthcare, but especially in the black community, don't share, just like he's sharing his experience with his child, we don't talk about them. It's like they're not there. And there's so many sickle cell patients doing wonderful things. Jermaine, I admire him. Jermaine has six sons. And Jermaine pushes every day. As Representative Rainey will tell you, he pushes every single day. And I'm telling you, he's living. Till he takes his last breath, there is not a person who knows Jermaine who will not be able to stand at his funeral and say, he didn't fight. Oh, he fought, but he lived. He's raising his children. He's doing all those powerful things. But the other thing that he's doing is not wallowing in self-pity, he is empowering his community to speak. And that's what we all have to do as healthcare workers. We sit back and we expect the government to say something. We expect researchers to say something, but we need to say something. When patients come into your ER or into your clinics, well, ain't nothing out there for them. I don't know what to do. Why not start something? He did. What's wrong with you guys? Y'all sit there and go, well, I don't know what to do to help them. Start making noise. Start calling pain management people and say, you know what, this 42 year old has pain. What can we do? There's research out there for pain clinics. They do a lot of things. We just don't push to give them access to those things. So you all as healthcare workers, change your voice. If they're changing faces, change your voice. And that's an important thing when you're speaking up. In pediatrics, everybody knows I'm the loudest voice. <laughs> All my patients will tell you I am the loudest voice. I will call a parent on the phone and say, you know better. I don't care what you got going on. Yeah, your lights cut off. Your boyfriend left you. The cat died. <laughs> I don't care. Why is the child not in clinic? What can we do to help you get to clinic? What can we do? You know, it's a teamwork approach. You have to start empowering them through your voice. You have to start talking to them as if they have power and they will start hearing themselves. Right now, they don't hear themselves. They don't know how to talk. They don't know who to turn to. They sure don't trust healthcare workers because they figure out you're not talking either. We have to be that voice. As the faces change, so must your voice. You have to start talking. You have to start talking to people. Not only people, you have to start raising your hand when you go to these conferences. Well, how does that affect, you know, sickle cell patients? When you have nursing conferences, well, you know, there's another population we don't talk about. You know, where is that voice? 
and it's kind of interesting that that saying that the teachers convention uh, for the, the school nurses actually uh, they'll be having their conference and convention here in Little Rock on uh, July 15th and 16th guess what's on their agenda yes. sickle cell is <laughs> first year for that y'all <laughs> because they are now realizing because we've made such a fuss and we've written more letters than anybody probably cares to read. But because we're changing our voice when it comes to our pediatric patients, we're yelling, hey, what happened to 504? Hey, where is that IEP? Hey, mama, he shouldn't be missing all the school. Hey, there's a school law now that says you can't miss but X amount of days. Otherwise, guess where you end up at? In jail and in court. And the parents get upset. But we have to start making that understand parents understand teachers understand but school nurses must be that voice and they now recognize that in the state of arkansas a lot of people when you hear arkansas they get this misunderstanding that we're a behind state y'all we're the leader of the pack i don't understand why we think that we're so far behind representative rainer can tell you we're not as far behind as you think because the same struggles we're having in transition of care from pediatrics to adult it is nationwide. It is worldwide. It is not just here. And speaking of that, as we change faces, we're looking for people to start pushing for that clinic to open at UAMS. That requires money. But guess what else it requires? Manpower. <laughs> Nurses have got to say, you know what? I'm willing to learn about this disease. I'm willing to study up on it. Hey, I'm willing to go over there and work in that clinic. Hey, doc, you know what? You got that one day a week, we don't have that many patients. You know, you're an internal medicine guy. Why don't we start seeing sickle cell patients? Change your voice. Start empowering your physician that you work with to say, hey, we got time over here in family medicine clinic. Why don't you read up and we can have us a half day sickle cell clinic at UAMS. You can be the first physician to do that. Changing your voice, speaking a little bit louder moving a few people. That shows if you're interested as a nurse, as a social worker, as the LPN, they may start listening to the fact that, well, somebody's out there fighting for them, maybe I'll start reading up on sickle cell. Maybe I'll start getting into the research of sickle cell. Um, I'll add some more patients and open some more Medicaid and Medicare slots for these patients. Start being that voice. All it takes is one person. He was one person for his son. His wife was the second person for her son. Took two people, but look what they've done. Look at Jermaine. He's one person with the disease, but he is a mover shaker across the state. There is not one person he hasn't touched. There's not one person's hand he hasn't shook hands with. There's not one person he hasn't asked for money from. He's not shaming his game. Support sickle cell. Put your money where your mouth is. Oh, you don't know anything about it? Oh, I'll send somebody over there to teach you. Oh, you don't have anything to do in the month of September? Oh, that's sickle cell month. Let's come down to your county and do a walk. He's done it every year. Changing his voice. Knowing where his power is. Knowing his source. Knowing who to talk to. That's important. That's the changing face in Arkansas. Always, as a, as a healthcare worker, we are sometimes hesitant to rock the boat. The sickle cell clinic at... Uh, UAMS. It's taking its time. I'm trying to be patient. And people who know me know I fuss about that because I think it's, it's taking too long. It, to me, that institution should be the first institution should have had it years ago. They're 10 years behind the ball on that. And that's just me being personal with that. Because 10 years is when the face of sickle cell changed across the nation. That's when these patients start hitting that mark of 30, when they used to didn't see 30. And we should have been on the ball and then pushing. The only people that were pushing was from pediatrics. The adult world was like, oh, they only come in because they want pain management. They only come in because they need drugs. If you understand the disease, you'll understand pain is part of the disease. When people come in with cancer, does anybody deny them a pain med? Nobody says that they have cancer. Oh, forget about their stuff. They'll be all right. <laughs> You're the first nurse to run and say, oh, you need a PCA. Oh, I can get you a pain clinic, get you a patch. Oh, you need a central line, I'll get you that. You know, you, you're an advocate for them. 
What about that sickle cell patient? What about their central line? What about their patch? What about their pain management? Oh, we can't give them oxycodone and we can't give them oxycontin because you know that community over there, girl, they be selling it and they melting it down and, and doing all kinds of things. <laughs> That's how they view us. And who perpetuates that continuously? Healthcare. We perpetuate that. That voice is loud. Oh, they don't need nothing, girl. They can go smoke a blunt. They'll be all right. It's all right. That's all they ever do over there in that community. Oh, they can get a drink. They'll be all right. But see, you've turned your voice down by judgment. Not everybody does that. Not every face out there is doing that. And because they present in miserable conditions, does not mean that's the way they want to be either. Start taking back your judgments and start finding out how do they get to this point? What help do they want? Have you ever had a conversation with an adult sickle cell patient? Very few people have a conversation with adult sickle cell patients. When they hit 21 and have to leave Arkansas Children's Hospital, we send them over to St. Vincent's, we send them to UAMS, and we send them to Baptist. And in the ER, they shut them down. In the ER, they can sit in the waiting room for four to six hours. That's at Baptist, that's at St. Vincent's, and that's at UAMS. Why are they sitting? If they roll through the door and they have cancer, do you let them sit? No. You all make every accommodation and protocol there is known to man to make sure that they get the care that they need. But we as healthcare workers don't change our voice for them. We don't advocate for them in the ER. And when they come into the ER, we as nurses and healthcare workers, we shut down and we allow them to be misused. Instead of going to a physician, hey, they sat in the ER waiting room for the past hour and a half and they're really upset and they're really hurting. What can we do? And if they back away and say, well, I don't want to do that, call somebody. Make some noise. You won't get fired. Everybody always thinks they're going to get fired. Sometimes people want to see what you got. Sometimes somebody wants to hear what you have to say. And most of the time, that changes their opinion of not only the patient in the waiting room, it changes their opinion of you because then you're not just a nurse, you're a patient advocate. That's what we were trained for. And yet we forget that part of our jobs. And I'm speaking to everybody here, we cannot lose that part of our voice. It's important for us to say, you know what? They deserve the best care there is. They deserve support groups. They deserve rallies. They deserve a day. They deserve a month. They deserve that attention. And that's important in this community. That's again, changing the face. What happens when you change the face? You gotta change the voice. It's really important. Understanding the difference between sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait. Sickle cell trait is getting a lot of attention because what? There are people who are dying because they have trait. A lot of people say, mm, that's because of disease, something happens, and we even have the misconception that their sickle cell trait has become their disease. That doesn't happen. If they have trait, they are carriers. But as carriers, what do we tend to forget about in healthcare? 101 basic biology. They still have sickle cells on board. At least 40% of their red blood cells are sickle cells. Under certain conditions, that sickle cell level will rise whether it's under low oxygen, whether it's under stress, dehydration, serious illness, car accident, having a baby, those things add stress to sickle cell trait people, okay? When they're carriers, their body goes through similar changes that sickle cell disease patients can have. Sickle cell trait patients are also prone to having gallbladder disease. They're also prone to having sometimes mild pain crisis. They can also have symptoms that are related to respiratory illnesses related to the effects from their sickle cell trait because about 40% of their red blood cells are sickle cells. And we lose sight of that. It's not that sickle cell trait becomes disease, it's just that there are so many aggravating factors that can make them have issues just with the amount of sickle cells they have on board. Okay, 
So everybody understand, trait does not become disease, right? I don't want to hear nobody say that ever again. <laughs> That's another one of my irritating factors. They think it becomes something. It doesn't change. It doesn't metamorphose into something else. Uh, but that also has influenced our sports community. The reason being is, who all were cheering for the Giants in the Super Bowl? And one of their players couldn't go. Why? The last time he went to Denver, what happened to him? He almost died. He got on the football field, played like a champ, but he almost died right after the game. He had splinter sequestration crisis. He lost his gallbladder. It was terrible for a brother. And then they ended up going back to the Super Bowl this past year, and he couldn't go. And he felt bad about that, but on the healthcare channels, he talked about that struggle within himself. But he said he took it with pride that he was a face that could give education to people about why he could not go. And that was important because that was the first time his family had ever dealt with sickle cell disease in his family. And, it, and he knew it was there, they just had never dealt with it. So those are important things that you have to understand as being that voice. Sometimes you get pushed into it, other times you need to go gracefully into it. But he was pushed into the forefront. But they, he could not travel to Denver, Colorado because of his sickle cell trait. And that's part of that other education piece. Also, what's the grand influence on sports now, guys? What do they require high school seniors who are going into sports, D1 or D2? They had to bring what to the team meeting? Proof of their sickle cell status. If anybody in this state wants to play D1 or D2 sports at any level now, especially the college level, they cannot play until they are cleared sickle cell status wise. And that's everyone, whether you're black, white, purple, green, doesn't matter. And y'all on that phone, it's wonderful to hear a white person call and say, I don't think my child has to be tested because, you know, we're not black. <laughs> and I'm like, that is the grandest thing. I think it's really cool because they're not uncomfortable to say it over the phone. Now, if we were face to face, they wouldn't say a thing. <laughs> but I'm just saying, on the phone, they talk. And I have to go through and explain that. But that's an education curve for that community. That changing face, now it's got another voice. You understand what I'm saying, guys? Changing face gets a changing voice. So now, you have all of these parents across the country who are, have their kids that are playing, it, especially here in the state of Arkansas, Fayetteville, boy, 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 and UCA. Those two schools, woo, you don't understand. It's traumatic for those parents. They were like, we ain't got sickle cell in our family. And then don't let one come up positive they have sickle cell trait. Then there's a question of paternity all of a sudden. <laughs> when did I get in my family? It happens every, every July and August. We ain't had none of that in our family. Where they, he is not mine. I know he ain't. <laughs> it happens all the time. And it is so funny because changing faces, we're changing that voice. But it's being influenced by outside factors that we never, ever had to look at before. But because it's such a liability for these sickle cell trait patients to play athletics. It is important for them to protect them and adjust their schedule. So that changing voice is also being pushed in the athletic world, whether they're playing D1 or D2 now. D2 didn't come until this past year. And that's when they decided D2 sports because there was just as much now going into D2. They now have to have proof of their sickle cell status. Whether you're black, white, purple, green, yellow, doesn't matter. So when they call you on the phone and say, I need a test and the parent is crying, because she don't know why, that is why. They have to cover themselves because it's a huge liability. But they also are now adjusting their practice schedules. And a lot of people think that's a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. If they want to participate and do athletics, I think we should do all that we can to protect them as athletes. That's important. That is highly important. Doesn't matter if they have sickle cell trait, just protect them. They're young and they want to do something, hey, I'm all for it not sitting on the couch looking at the TV. So those are things that you can understand about sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait. The latest research, we talked about newborn screening. Um, everybody knows that patients in, with sickle cell disease, irregardless of type, 
Uh, if they have any type of sickle cell disease, they take penicillin starting as soon as they're diagnosed, usually at age 10 to 14 days of age. They continue it until they're five to seven years of age. So when you, the pharmacist called, y'all have to realize they take liquid penicillin when they are babies. It's a big deal. I, there's not a pharmacy I haven't talked to. We had to go over this. If they're babies, that means that parent has to go to the pharmacy every 14 days. And that's during the first three to four kid, years of that kid's life. Every 14 days, that parent has to go to the pharmacy to pick up the penicillin. Why? Because the efficacy of liquid penicillin is only good for 14 days. So they have to go to the pharmacy every 14 days. So when, for you pediatric nurses, when you get a parent that's irritated about, I need a refill, they are irritated because they have to deal with the pharmacy so much. They have to see their pharmacist every 14 days. Uh, they have to get folic acid once the kid starts to be a year old, then they start folic acid and that's every day. So they have to, if they're not going every, every 14 days, they have to go every month to pick up folic acid. And everybody thinks you can get folic acid over the counter. Yes, you can. But the dose that we prescribe is one milligram and that's only by prescription. Um, immunizations, and if you parents have high school seniors who are going to go to college next year or this year, check the immunization schedule. Because the immunization schedule has changed again. They are now requiring boosters on shots they got when they were 11. And we are now having to reinform that community. So immunization changes all the time. So we have to be knowledgeable and be patient with parents when they call and say, my child can't even get into register for college because they got to have another shot. So it goes across the community. They have to have these shots. But be, we have to be empowering to those parents. Um, hydroxyurea. How many of you have heard of hydroxyurea for sickle cell patients? Very good. How many have heard of hydroxyurea for renal cancer or cardiology patients? Yes. That one of the funniest things they found out about hydroxyurea, which is used in our sickle cell patients, uh, it was used in cardiology, it's been used in renal disease, and it's an actual chemotherapy drug for cancer patients. And what it does is it helps your bone marrow turn on hemoglobin F, which helps to improve, improve your red blood cell count. In patients with sickle cell disease, especially those with se severe disease, it helps to decrease their amounts of sickle cells that they have on board, which helps them, number one, feel better, Number two, they have fewer pain crises. Number three, they are not getting exposed to blood transfusions when they're ill because they have hydroxyurea on board. Hydroxyurea, though, comes at a cost. What's the cost to them? Time. Hydroxyurea, we have to check their levels. Remember what I just said? What did I say? What kind of drug it is? Chemotherapy. It's a mild chemotherapeutic agent. So they have to come to clinic at least every three months once they've been on a stable dose. Every 60 to 90 days, they have to come in. We have to protect them because it can make them drop their white counts and make them susceptible to infection. So they also can drop their platelet count. So those are things that in the adult world, they don't like going to the doctor every 60 to 90 days. But we have got to learn to support this as the what changes, as the face changes. So we have to start to adjust care for them because they are going to need, require medical care. That's why I wish that sickle cell clinic at UMS was up and running. We have hydroxyurea we could use across the board in the sickle cell community for those who are coming in the ER constantly with pain. We can start to manage those patients from just simply one drug, not pain management drug, I'm talking about one drug that's actually therapeutically going to treat them. Hydroxyurea has to be taken every day. As I said, the way it don't work is if you don't take it. And we tell our patients, and the labs will always tell us if they're taking it. That's one drug that they can take that improves their disease greatly, increases their ability and quality of life greatly, and it preserves their organs. They're not having as many crises. They're not having as much cell turnover because they're red blood cells. What's the average lifespan of a red blood cell in a sickle cell patient? Anybody know? Anybody know? Take a guess, somebody. Ten days is actually how long they live. 
red blood cells turn over in a sickle cell patient 10 days. What's the average lifespan of a normal red blood cell? Anybody know? 120 days. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. So think about it. Instead of 120 days, their red blood cells have to turn over every 10 days because they have red blood cell destruction that high. What has to crank up then? Their bone marrow. That's why they're kind of small in a lot of our patients because they spend a lot of energy turning up their bone marrow to turn out a whole bunch of red blood cells at a high rate so they get tired quicker. They don't have enough time to be growing and being stocky. So we have to make sure that they're eating well, resting well, but also treating their bodies well. And understand that with hydroxyurea, we can kind of turn down that rate because hydroxyurea does drop that rate. Their red blood cells live longer. Their bone marrows have much more rest period in between. We just need as healthcare workers to be that voice to take care of them. We need a sickle cell clinic for adults. And the first treatment we would start out with is hydroxyurea across the board. And all we need is some nurses to monitor their labs, to call them on the phone. We need a social worker to be able to coordinate their care so they can get there. And actually we could have an APN clinic and now we have physician assistants in the state. If we don't have, as I say, we don't have MDs, we surely have APNs and PAs in the state. They can run the clinic. Uh huh. Oh, they can be as young as nine months now. That's the other changing face in sickle cell. So everybody always says, why are sickle cell patients in pediatrics doing so well? It's because as soon as we recognize that they are going to be real big trouble with their disease, we start them on hydroxyurea. The one thing about that is they have to come to Children's Hospital. What's the big secret to that? It's the liquid preparation. It is an unstable compound. And other compounders in the state of Arkansas refuse to learn how to compound hydroxyurea. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, that's that voice again. The only compounders there are for that drug is at Arkansas Children's Hospital. For one month supply of liquid hydroxyurea for an infant nine months to say three, four, five, six years of age, guess how long it takes them to prepare that one month supply? Four hours. It's an unstable compound. It has to be prepared under a hood. Magic things happen. Poof, poof, and they give us liquid hydroxyurea. <laughs> Just saying that's how it happened, y'all. But it is amazing to me that we have compounders throughout the state that we have called and contacted. Our hospital has called, and they have not picked that up to do compounding for. And that's why we don't see it widely used across the state unless they come to our hospital, and they have to come so often. So the changing face for our pediatric uh, population is, yeah, they're doing great, but they have to be at the hospital. They have to come to the clinic all the time. But we're working with that because their primary care physicians won't even draw their labs and send them to us, which is, uh, ooh, we ain't going to talk about that. Oh, <laughs> y'all don't understand. It's hard to work with some and easy to work with others. But that's just one of those things. As the face has changed, as treatments change, some people adapt, some people don't. So anybody got any questions on hydroxyurea? And they have to take it every day. It is important that they take it every day. And because it's a chemotherapy drug, guess what? Everybody in the household can't handle it because it's absorbed through the skin as a tablet form. Yes, ma'am. Um, what, what the cost is uh, for that? Most insurance, uh, insurance is covered. Believe it or not, Arkansas Medicaid and Medicaid, they are the bomb. We didn't have any trouble with them paying for this drug. And that's because it's an older high, uh, chemotherapy drug. The most expense comes when we have to do the liquid preparation. Medicaid covers that 100%. We didn't have any trouble, thanks to Dr. Becton and Dr. Sassente and Dr. Query. They, I mean, if you, uh, there is nothing I can't say more about the man that I work for. I love Dr. Becton, and most of you who know Dr. Becton know his heart has always been in the right place. But it's his empowerment, it's his approach, it's his commitment to making sure everyone, whether your child has cancer or whether your child has hemophilia, whether your child has sickle cell, whether your child has von Willebrand's disease, whether your child has a DBT, whether your child now with, we haven't seen in forever, 
He's a big studier now in childhood melanoma because of sun exposure now. We now see children with melanoma. I mean, these are changing faces and it's not just in sickle cell, but Dr. Becton is probably one of the biggest champions I know out there. He is an awesome young man. He wants to say he's old, but he's not. Uh, and Dr. Sassente and Dr. Crary and Dr. Sailors, their uh, attention to research and dedication to our patients who have had strokes, who have uh, had issues with their sickle cell disease related to asthma, uh, as well as heart conditions. Uh, we also have several patients who have severe cystic fibrosis the worst thing you can have with your sickle cell disease. And their sickle cell disease is very rarely their problem, it's always their CF. So we have some great doctors at Arkansas Children's Hospital in hematology and I do applaud them, but I really thank them for their commitment to the sickle cell community. I really, really do. Um, any other questions on hydroxyurea? We also do head ultrasounds to screen our children early for strokes. So that's why you don't see sickle cell patients having strokes anymore. Uh, they do still have strokes, but you don't see it as frequent because we are able to screen their head starting at age three for, to uh, rule out the risk. If we start seeing changes in their vasculature, in their, in their heads, and it's a simple imaging through the temporal windows, we can see the blood flow in their cerebral arteries now. And if we catch it in time, those kids don't have strokes. And if they do have strokes, guess what we have at Arkansas Children's? We have apheresis. <laughs> Uh, and that's my sister, by the way, uh, and she is the apheresis nurse, uh, and we work closely together. But the big thing is, is that uh, apheresis, it can be used across the board, but it's one of the primary care things that we do in sickle cell. We have patients who have bad strokes, but if you see those kids today, you'd never know. They go to kindergarten, they go, as he says, they're going to third grade, and they are going to what college? We now have one of our nurses, one of our top, oh, I love it, psychiatric nurses that we have. She graduated probably about three years ago, and she had a stroke when she was nine, and she's one of the top nurses in the state in, in psych, and she loves what she does, and she works in Northwest Arkansas. I'm proud to say that because before we did not say that they were living. They are living people. They're doing things. They're living and graduating from college. They're having babies. They're contributing to society, they're getting jobs at Hollister. But I mean, this is a big deal for teenagers. They didn't work before because they didn't feel like it or they missed so much school they didn't qualify for. We celebrate every time one of our 14 year olds get their little restricted driver's license. It's a big deal because they didn't think about driving 10, 15 years ago. Changing faces means they're now like everybody else. They're starting to meal and do the things that other people do, even though they have their limitations on certain things. But now we're talking about them doing things in school. We're talking about them doing research, becoming nurses. That's that changing face. Um, we also do straight blood transfusions, but apheresis, going back to that, apheresis is called partial red blood cell exchange. One of those kids come in with a stroke, the first thing they do is get on the hot line and call them. They wake them up at three in the morning and they come to the hospital at three in the morning. They get out their bed. We only have two apheresis nurses at Children's and they're on call 24 seven. And those nurses, we have Sandra Smith and Zelinda Owens. They get up in the middle of the night, go to PICU as soon as they get that line in that kid. They apheresis those kids and the parents are so surprised because usually 12 hours later, this kid is on a little bike trucking down the hall. And the parents are like, they couldn't move anything. They couldn't talk. What happened? 12 hours made a difference. But what we do is we pull off that sickle cell blood, put fresh blood on without making them hemodynamically unstable, which means making their blood shift too much because we're taking off and putting on. So it's a direct exchange. And what a difference it makes. What a difference it makes. Those kids do well and they are on transfusion forever until as adults they opt to come off. But we get them through their years of growing and they do magnificent things, but we don't let them have the symptoms of stroke. So they're protected, they grow up happy and healthy and do all those normal things. But that's important for me to say that because what happens in the adult population? You all have apheresis here at St. Vincent's. You all have apheresis over at Baptist and at UMS. But not once do you all call an apheresis nurse when those people are sick and in that hospital. 
in pain or having pneumonia or having a heart condition or having a kidney condition, not one person in an adult facility would call an apheresis nurse and come and do a partial red blood exchange, cell exchange. Makes a whole difference. They don't have to hang bags of blood and make this person sicker because they're becoming too thick with their blood. You can simply call an apheresis nurse, they put in a line, they do an exchange, and the person feels miraculously well. And they can actually have an apheresis program for adults. And these parents, and, I mean, these patients would live years without having their lungs and their livers and their kidneys and their brains be affected so significantly by their sickle cell disease. We can protect those patients. Health, adult health care has just not caught up with that changing face yet. But what are y'all going to do? Change your voice. That's important. So put that in, back in the back of your mind. Since I mentioned in blood, what else do we need to do in our community? Push red blood cell drives in the African American community as well as the Hispanic community. Why? Everybody says all blood is the same. The devil is lie. <laughs> If you've ever seen somebody get a blood transfusion and react, you know the devil is a lie. A blood, we have certain antibodies that are culturally, it does different antibodies in different, uh, say, different cultures, shall I say. And it's not so much that our blood is different, but there are certain th differences in blood that will cause, you know, Terry can get blood, Zelina can get blood, but they can react totally different to the same blood from the same donor depending on their antibody status. So it's important in the African-American community that we start to push for blood drives in our community. Seriously, for churches, Red Cross will come out on a Sunday for your church. So while I preach a hallelujah, after church, instead of everybody going to eat, we get some cookies and juice and we meet in the parking lot. <laughs> and line up at the Red Belt Seven. That's what we're gonna do, Red Cross. We're gonna start seeing that after church, okay y'all? That's that changing face, we have to change the voice. And we have to start getting people to understand it's important to become blood donors. And now that the Red Cross couldn't get adults to donate, guess where they're going now? To the high schools. If you're 16 and over, got your parents' permission, those kids donate freely. My son did. When he turned 16, that's the first thing, he, one of the first things he wanted to do besides date and drive was get blood. <laughs> So I can tell y'all, it is awesome. My husband is a routine donor. He has a rare t uh, blood type. And he has no problem when the Red Cross calls him, yo, Elvis, you know what? We were low on this blood, okay. I'm not on duty this day. I'll make sure I come up there. He gets blood and he comes home. Now he might give y'all a ticket later on in the night because <laughs> he feels a little fatigued, but that's all right. <laughs> Pain management. Pain meds are important. Let's not be afraid to give them, as I said earlier, okay, guys? Let's start, stop worrying about addiction, and let's start worrying about treatment and taking care of these patients. XJ, for those who get a lot of blood, they can get a lot of iron buildup. XJ is out there. They don't have to be hooked uh, to uh, medicines that are Desperol via IV. They can actually get XJ, and that's oral. But what's the catch to that? They have to come to clinic every month. <laughs> and nobody wants to do that. Now, to identify the different healthcare resources, let's still continue to work with the AHEX in the state. We need satellite clinics in, others, in other areas of the state. We just don't have enough staffing, enough backing to do that in the adult world. But in pediatrics, we're doing that. So just be aware of that. We just need to continue to educate. Also, start logging on and looking for different education opportunities in sickle cell. That will help a whole lot if you all start educating yourselves about sickle cell. There is a sickle cell website that is always up with tutorials of all kinds. Start taking a look at those sites and ed educating yourselves on what sickle cell disease is. So when you hear these horror stories or this misinformation, you'll already know the answer. No, that don't happen. Sickle cell trait don't turn into the disease. Y'all are crazy. It does not. Let me tell you what I learned on such and such a site. Start building up your references, educating yourselves. The other thing is, let's work with medical aid transportation. Transportation is a big deal in a rural state like Arkansas. If somebody wants to go into business, it makes me so angry when I hear young people say, I just don't know what I'm going to do. 
Can you drive? Can your parents like get you a van and help or can your church support you and you be a driver? Transportation for medical care is important in the state of Arkansas, even right here in the city. We can't get somebody from West Little Rock over here to Central Little Rock because they don't have any transportation. We have to start realizing transportation is a big deal. So we need more transportation out there. And that's important. If your church wants to volunteer into the DHS system, yes, they get paid for that. But those are avenues of people stop saying that they can't do and start looking at opportunities where you can do. Um, the other thing is, besides Red Cross, is to help with support groups. Uh, the sickle cell support group that Jermaine runs, I love it because they support the kids. We're coming up to having camp. And as Representative Rain will tell you, Jermaine pushes, and as well as his wife, fundraise, fundraise, fundraise. But we want to send our kids to camp so they don't have to pay for it. So donations are always accepted. And we're going to have 22, I do believe, sickle cell patients at camp uh, in the last week of June. And they're paid for by donations from you guys. That's the way that works. The other thing is, is that their siblings get a chance to come with them and we pay for them so it's free to the families because a lot of people cannot afford it. And we make sure that they get the transportation that's necessary to get there. So support those type of activities and that's empowering to that group. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, sickle cell identification in schools. I talked about the school nurses. I work with the teachers. But the other thing is, is to continue to ask these parents to do individual education plans for these patients. If you know they're going to be out a lot of school, make sure that they have their IEPs. Also make sure that they do a 504 plan. 504 back in the day used to be if you're as, you even hate to say this across the thing, but they used to call it the crazy check. That's what 504 was associated with, but it's no longer, it's for anybody with serious illnesses. So that's another thing. The other thing that I wanted to hit on, oh, you made me think of it, disability. It is amazing because I get parents call me, they have, say, a nine-month-old. My friend down the street told me uh, uh, that I need to apply for disability. Can uh, you send me my baby's records and, and write a letter for my baby? Because, you know, they got the disability. They got sickle cell. They're nine months old, hadn't even crawled good yet. <laughs> you only see them in clinic. They're never sick. My thing for that is... Don't claim what you don't want. Because I would never claim a disability for a nine month old. If they are doing well, don't claim it. The other thing is, is that sickle cell is not a disability. I need to make that across the board. Sickle cell disease is not a list, listed disability. They can have disabling complications related to their sickle cell disease, which then qualifies them for disability. But as Representative Rainey says, who wants to be listed as disabled if you feel like you're able? You know, and a, a lot of people run from that and there are others who try to take advantage of that. And we have to be so careful. But I tell everybody, educate yourselves. But if you see a child or an adult with multiple hospitalizations uh, or having multiple issues with their sickle cell disease and they're in the clinic or in the ER or in the hospital a lot, Yes, they may qualify for disability, and there is no shame in that game because I feel that we should support that in any way, form, possible because that gives them the additional income, but also hopefully helps them afford their medications and transportation because a lot of them, you don't realize, they have to pay a friend to bring them. And that friend don't want to bring them for $5 worth of gas. They won't even drive them across town. And they rely on those kind of things. So be aware of that. But when a nine-month-old who's crawling and happy and having no complications with their sickle cell disease, it does something to my spirit for a parent to ask for that when it's not necessary. You don't understand what it means to have a disability. And that's a, people use that word loosely. There are people out here who need disability who can't get it. And then I got parents who walk in clinic dressed to the nines and everything else, but somehow they've managed to get disability for a kid who is not disabled. And it is an irritating factor to me because I feel that every man should stand his own. And every now and then we need to help them stand, but only when they need the help. Okay, don't misuse the system because it's costing the patients who actually 
need the system. Then it makes them go through 10,000 hoops to get something that you automatically know they need. But because there's some fraudulent work that goes on out there, there are a lot of, I'm telling you guys, you would never believe how many primary care physicians we have out there in the state that will help these people by documenting things that are not true. And it does hurt my feelings because I don't wish disability on anyone. But I also want the people who have disabil disabilities to get the assistance that they need, okay? Uh, we continue to support the, uh, support the sports, keeping them in school. Um, that's another thing for nurses to be aware of, and especially even those who go to college. Make sure you give them the proper letter and support so they can get proper housing in college, because I write letters for that, to make sure they have adequate access and ventilation because their bodies can't be subjected. Some of them get private rooms when they go to college. But in school, making sure they don't miss beyond, is it 12 days, guys? Is it 12 days? 10 days, I knew Ray would know, go girl. <laughs> 10 days, and they can have a doctor's excuse, right? It depends on the school, and I've discovered that. She's exactly right, go Ray. Certain schools, now y'all know the law, Arkansas law changed last school year, right? All of y'all are aware of that. They no longer have excused or unexcused absences in schools across Arkansas. It no longer exists. There's no such thing. If your child has the flu, there, it's just a day out. It's 10 days they can miss. A semester? Yeah. Per semester. But once they reach that 10 days, guess who they're looking for? The parent. And if you don't have documentation that says that child visited a healthcare facility or was sick, you have no appeal. And you can get, your first fine is $500 and or two days in jail. It's not, it is not simple in Arkansas anymore. But across the country, they are doing that. So just be aware of that. That's a change in the law across Arkansas. So we need to help them stay in school, write letters, but make sure we explain to them, document your days by calling me and saying your child is at home sick. So when they need a letter for court, then we can give it to them, okay? Anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am? For what now? Uh huh. Uh, if they are positive for sickle cell, who do we contact? I know we have like family or other doctors. Uh huh. That's a good question. To answer her question is, I'm going to back up a little bit. When you say testing for sickle cell, what's the test that you all run? A cyclodex, isn't it? Is it a cyclodex or is it a, a high, or is it a hemoglobin electrophoresis? It's a cyclodex. Cyclodex, most antiquated test. I wish they would erase it from the face of the earth. <laughs> oh, cyclodex will only tell you. It's a cheap test. It's an easy test. It is one of the most antiquated tests there is because you can go to Red Cross and get a, a cyclodex. It just tells you if you have sickle cells on board. Does not tell you if you have sickle cell trait or disease. If you are being encountered by a parent needing to know if their child has sickle cell trait or disease, run a hemoglobin electrophoresis. Don't go the cheap way out because that only aggravates and only prolongs the process. Do a hemoglobin electrophoresis. Yes, ma'am? Uh -huh. Right. But see, that's too much. That's lab draw unnecessary. Do the first test and call it a day. It's, it's just so simple. And when you have also uh, adult patients who come in, because we get a lot of families that don't know they have sickle cell in their family or know that they have C disease or thalassemia in their family, do a hemoglobin electrophoresis. Do not waste your time doing a cyclodex. Please don't, because then they gotta come back, like she just said, come back for another visit for a, another stick. And that when you can just do the hemoglobin electrophoresis right off the bat. Any other questions? And make sure that the parents have a copy of it with an explanation at the bottom. 
If you have any questions about your hemoglobin electrophoresis results, call our department and you'll usually get me. Uh, 364-1494. That's to the hematology secretary. 364-1494 and she will definitely send it to me. But do not waste your time doing a cyclodex, do a hemoglobin electrophoresis. Any other questions? Anybody else? All right, so y'all change your voice, your voices and your faces at the same time. But thank you guys. I appreciate it.